depending on the quarry that you extract them from, uh, even magmatites can have many uh, different structures and uh, colors. So here in our materials collection we have uh, all types of samples that were extracted in um, these quarries um, all over Europe at the time. Typical sediments uh, would be sandstone, or here this is a um, sort of um, a natural concrete consisting of um, gravel inserted in a, in a limestone matrix, and uh, this is called Nagelflue. It's extracted close to Munich, so each area on Earth has specific uh, stones that are closer. For example, behind me there's a public square covered with uh, Chinese granite uh, because transport is so cheap, but at the beginning the architecture of a certain area was erected in the stone that you could find close to that area. The advantage of artificial stone is that you have many parameters that you can influence. In this case, on the formwork of these concrete plates, we have inserted um, metallic uh, particles and so we could create a slightly reflective uh, surface. Next category here is a very uh, dense uh, concrete uh, which is called UHPC, ultra high performance concrete. And this can uh, have much finer formwork, much more precise uh, detailing. We could give all types of surface to the concrete by the formwork. Here, for example, this is bamboo inserted in the formwork. Here we have uh, vertical rails in the formwork. Then we can sand blast the surface so that, is not, that it is not as uh, slick anymore. Or we can treat it by hand uh, as we could with uh, natural stone. So most things uh, you can do with natural stone like polishing or vertical rails or this type of uh, rugged, rugged effect which is created with uh, special hammers like the one I'm holding um, can be done with concrete as well. Cement and uh, fibers can be combined to all sorts of plates and uh, this, for example, is uh, corrugated uh, fiber cement. Today, these cement-based elements, due to uh, um, textiles as reinforcement, can become much thinner than uh, they would become if you take metallic uh, reinforcement bars. So slate is a sediment of fine layers of uh, lime um, that has become stone. So as the layers are this fine, it can be uh, broken naturally to very thin plates that have been used for covering of roofs in many parts of the world uh, for a long, long time before they get replaced nowadays by artificial materials or for by uh, slate. So I told you about these adobe bricks and the building industry is developing all types of uh, plates as well that are uh, adobe uh, clay based with uh, natural uh, reinforcement like for example from hemp and things like this. So in the future we will see more of these uh, building materials that don't um, necessarily need a lot of energy to be produced. You can see that the natural stone has to be suspended in front of the insulation. So there are a lot of systems on the market. This is only one of them. They are held by pins here on the side so that they can move a little due to thermal expansion and uh, contraction and all this can be taken up by the system. It's not completely uh, waterproof. Water can get in through the joints, but this doesn't really harm the insulation because, uh, for example, stone wool 
can get wet and then dry out again and as long as there is air circulation in the system this is not a problem. Interior stucco uh, can be um, uh, lime based or gypsum based because uh, it's not exposed to as much uh, humidity. Exterior uh, stucco is very often cement based today um, although that uh, lime based stuccos are not uh, this bad because they take up more humidity than uh, cement based uh, stucco does. It also allows for a sort of respiration process in the masonry where it can take a certain amount of humidity and afterwards uh, evaporate this humidity again while by uh, a waterproof uh, stucco uh, this would be hauled inside the wall and that can cause uh, damage to the building. The clay matrix is brought in form by different processes like for example pressing it or extruding it and afterwards uh, you burn it uh, until it gets um, solid. So the, a certain point is attained where it uh, solidifies and then an even higher temperature uh, is needed to um, come to the sintering point. Sintering where the uh, structure of the material starts to melt. Here we have a cement based uh, stone that is used for paving. So it's a sort of concrete uh, block. Uh, where you add sand and uh, fine gravel together with cement and water and uh, create artificial stone out of this. This is rather lightweight. It's a clay brick. Uh, it is not as resistant to humidity and to compression as a burnt uh, clay brick uh, is, but it's a little lighter and it's more ecological because to produce it takes less energy, so less carbon dioxide emissions. And these ceramic material, materials might get another surface treatment to give them a, a layer of color and uh, to make them uh, water repellent or water resistant uh, according to what temperature this additional layer is burned in. We could add different materials like for example sawdust to the uh, clay before burning it and you can see that then you get a rather lightweight brick that can become bigger than the ordinary brick and is more insulating. So many of the insulation materials are based on organic uh, materials like wood in this case or sheep wool uh, in this case. Uh, but uh, some are uh, mineral as well. This is foam glass. You can see that glass wool can be obtained in different densities. This would be ideal to insulate uh, in a roof space where it has to be compressed slightly. What uh, type of use you want to this material for and then it can be modified although it's always uh, glass wool. It is a glass wool for thermal insulation of a roof or for a screed or whatsoever. So if you melt quartz, uh, soda and uh, lime, um, you will get glass after a certain time. And this glass mass, you can see it here, can then be brought into form different means. One of the most ancient ways was to blow a um, sort of void in this mass of glass and you would get a cylinder. A cylinder you could then cut off and lay out on a metallic surface so you would have uh, primitive uh, window panes. Today uh, this is done by um, process where you take the liquid glass and uh, spread it out on a zinc surface and then um, in the next step it will cool down and be the, the glass we use in our windows for example. 
So once we have obtained uh, the float glass, then we can start to combine it. And there are two places where we can combine. One is in the factory and uh, the other one is in a workshop of uh, somebody who uh, glazes windows, for example. So in the factory we have different kinds of glass. Uh, we could have simple float glass. So simple float glass um, breaks to shards when you break it. So this might be dangerous in some situations. So uh, we have a method which is called tempering. So this uh, simple float glass is heated and then uh, during the cooling process, it is uh, cooled down in a way that there is compression on the outside and tension in the middle, so that we can um, use the compressibility of uh, the glass, which is nine times higher than the, the resistance to tension, by uh, pre-stressing the glass in a way. And this is far more resistant and it breaks to little pieces instead of shards. So this uh, is something that would be used for auto uses as a windshield and um, at other places where we want to have to do with little brittle things rather than big shards. Where you can hurt yourself. The disadvantage is that you cannot work on it uh, anymore once you have uh, pre-stressed uh, the glass. So all the holes, all the cuts have to be done before uh, you uh, pre-stress it. Another method of creating safe glass is laminating the glass. So we take two layers of glass and glue them together with a transparent film. So this is called laminated glass and uh, laminated glass is mostly used for overhead uh, uses where you don't want to have glass uh, shards or little particles falling on your head. So once uh, the bird here commits uh, suicide on your glass roof um, this shouldn't break in little pieces, but uh, stay together because it's made out of uh, laminated glass. Something which is produced uh, more in the workshop type environment is uh, something like insulating glass. So here you have one layer of glass on one side, the other layer on the other side. They are glued together with aluminum butyl strips and then sealed off on both sides. And inside you can have different things, uh, either gases or um, you can extract the air as well. You don't want uh, condensation on the inside of the glass, so you add some salt-like material in these strips uh, as to extract humidity. And the, um, the two layers of the insulating glass can be treated in different ways. They can have a coating. These coatings would normally be on the inside, so if you clean the glass you would not harm them. And this uh, coat could be uh, reflective, for example, so that it keeps the heat on the inside or it um, could uh, keep the sun on the outside as well. So instead of two layers, we could have uh, three layers. So this gets better and better, and the U value of three layers would be around 0.7 um, watt per square meters uh, Kelvin, um, which is the U value of the glass, and the double glazing would be around 0.9 up to 1.1. 